mechanical behavior of engineering materials and structures at uh, sub-zero temperatures. I think uh, Dr. Vasudevan took you to very high temperatures at Crete and then I'm going to quench you rather <clears throat> to sub-zero temperatures. Well, starting with uh, Rigveda, the existence, which is the tenth mandala on creation and existence or even the non-existence. It says there were impregnations, there were powers, there was energy below and there was impulse above. It applies to Krishi Mandala, it applies to intron machines, UTS machines, and it applies to everything. Like there's energy, there's power, there's impulse, and there are impregnations like composites or nanomaterials. <laughs> Next slide. So the contents of my talk are going to be in introduction and uh, background. <laughs> the research gaps and openings. Like I would not uh, like to say that this is an open end, too much of an open end is the research gap actually. And uh, I'm going to talk about the objectives and methodology and uh, compare the room temperature with the sub zero results and uh, follow it with uh, metallurgical as well as form discussion, form based, mechanical based discussion. And uh, <clears throat> there would be a few uh, inputs on design as well. And uh, <clears throat> I would summarize my results and compare it with a few other results and uh, the technology and references. I'll be completing my talk. Coming to the background of fabulous geography, we all know that materials are used in sub-zero temperatures, especially in the geography. And uh, India itself has the lowest temperature as something like minus 55, some, sometime, somewhere around the uh, left. And uh, <coughs> somewhere around left. And uh, Tamil Nadu and Rajasthan and Delhi are pretty hot. At the same time, Delhi is pretty cool. So we have temperatures ranging from about uh, plus 55 degrees Celsius in Jaisalmer to minus 55 degrees Celsius. And uh, we are looking at uh, not only VCC materials, but also polymers and composites and other materials that also go through a reptile vessel transition. <coughs> well, as the automotive materials reach very high temperatures during operation, can otherwise even be cooled down to sub-zero temperatures if they are running in the Himalayas or any other area, the fatigue response of material known to exhibit DBT, however low, even if it's low, becomes important in qualifying the material to set for safe use or to engineering use. The correlation between DBT and uh, fatigue is a subject area that is not at all understood or probably less understood. <clears throat> well, we are trying to look at the anti-roll bars, leaf prints and the other candidate materials that uh, look at uh, <coughs> the ductile metal transition. I'm giving you a classic example of a paper which was published in 2005, uh, which uh, dealt with severe impact of uh, energy versus temperature and ductile metal transition temperature. This was published in SA in 2005. And uh, I'm sorry to say that most of the ductile metal transition papers are on Charlie, isod or impact, and then there is even a misconception that DBT goes synonymous with impact and nothing else. Well, coming to DBTT, this is a very simple plot of even nylon going through ductile metal transition and uh, zinc going through ductile metal transition, so it's HCP in a mild way. And uh, obviously, we all know why BCC metals go through a ductile metal transition because of the slip and cleavage and then other kinds of slip operations. <coughs> About uh, fabulous geographies and the deep inner seas, let me just classify that physicists have a different conception. They simply say cryogenic temperature or low temperature, but for a mechanical metallurgist like me, like I would say that sub-zero temperatures are up to minus 70 degrees Celsius because of the fabulous geography that we have. And low temperatures normally come up to about minus 170 degrees Celsius. And uh, we have that liquid nitrogen or something else coming in between the low temperature and the cryogenic temperature. So cryogenic temperatures are classified up to near absolute zero, where the quantum gases play a lot of degeneracy related low temperature attainment. Coming to statistics, with my PhD student Amol Banage, I did a very serious study of actually how people forgot to fill the sub-zero phenomenon despite the titanic <coughs> fraternity and then the liberty shift incident. 
what happened was that fatigue at room from fatigue at room temperature was uh, published quite a bit in the last two decades whether it was scopus or non scopus or web of science or thomson reuters or whatever it is i went by some publishers who could last two decades so they had the scopus or not so like there were 4500 plus papers on fatigue at room temperature and a lot of them look at fatigue creep interactions in fact like people who look at creep look at uh, look at fatigue look at creep more often so fatigue at high temperatures was about 14000 publications and the fatigue creep interactions especially in high temperature fatigue were about 6000 it is something more than what you do when you look at fatigue at room temperature that's surprisingly correct because people are lot people are worried about uh, the uh, temperature sustainability dynamic vaporization static vaporization and other aspects and uh, coming to cryogenic or low temperature general fatigue even in my mechatronic systems or bio systems or any sort of a fatigue you have only 1800 papers and surprisingly for sub zero temperature fatigue there are only 54 papers and nine of them are thank you So that tells you the importance of having to look at this particular aspect. So some of the pioneering investigations were by Pavlich, then Dutta, and uh, Sesini et al. Uh, they looked at uh, low temperature metals and then behavior of materials at uh, cold region temperatures. A program national plan was uh, even uh, conducted at Hanover. Tensile and impact behavior of micro alloy medium carbon steels were even looked at. and uh, what happened was that you know that in the 80s there was a big boom on superconductivity so uh, a lot of people started going the other direction you know like they were not uh, too much uh, interested i do have one paper in superconductivity and uh, uh, professor jacob knows about it like uh, a lot of people started going the other way to superconductivity and then there were a lot of uh, papers related to superconductivity and then superconducting ceramics and then some of them Took to fatigue and then other uh, interesting phenomena. So that is how people started getting interested in the low temperature uh, when there was a boom because of uh, YBA to CO3 plus oxygen kind of a uh, interest. So coming to the research gaps and open ends, we did a lot of literature survey, but actually, like unfortunately, we didn't have to go into too many details. That there were only a handful of papers addressing some zero phenomena. There are some secretive documents or company documents which Ford or Chrysler or Benz or say Mahindra's or many of them have because I myself did a short consultancy project for Mahindra, but they are all company documents and they are not published. <coughs> so coming to the literature review and then what is being based on it in the automotive industry, like there is a lot of service fatigue loading which may result in failure. And uh, still, diverse research papers have been published. Sir, diverse research papers have been published on fatigue behavior of automotive materials, while little or no attention, as far as the published literature is concerned, has been paid on addressing some actual problems like extreme temperature conditions or ductile to brittle transition temperature, sub-zero temperature conditioning, which are all applied to automotive systems, subsystems, or products. So, in light of durability of automotive materials in uh, real-time application, the environmental temperature is one of the important parameters. And if you are working with polymers and composites, added to the temperature, you have got to be very careful about humidity too, because of hydrothermal and hydrothermal interest. <coughs> so, the materials used in the automobile undergo severe environmental degradation. So, the temperature effects on materials must be considered and understood. And uh, some of these materials go through the tire to brittle transition, and some of them don't. So there is enough fatigue data available for materials at room temperatures and high temperatures, and uh, the correlation between room temperature and high temperature properties with the DVD and fatigue is a subject area that is less understood. The fatigue response of material is known to exhibit DVD. This becomes important in qualifying a material for safe use in an automobile, for reliability for a prescribed time, or durability over long term. <laughs> well, 
So, coming to the resource methodology of the problem definition, well, um, what exactly happened was that uh, um, the materials and specimens that we selected were obviously steel. We wanted to look at steel where most of the investigations that were available on sub zero qualification, the potent, the choppy, or isode, or dynamic, or impact, or other kind of uh, uh, strain rates within the dynamic regime. So we wanted to look at SA1040 steel cubes, glass fabric cubes, epoxy uh, composite cubes, then C45 steel beams, whose manganese, uh, cobalt, chromium, and uh, other components are slightly different, which is used in the leaf spring. And uh, we wanted to take a look at the glass fabric epoxy beam as well for potential use in uh, composites for uh, applications in uh, uh, automobiles. Well, coming to the anti-roll bar or the leaf spring, which we took as candidate material, uh, we first did the flexural quasi-static test at uh, room temperature, and uh, flexural quasi-static test, test again at room temperature, followed by a systematic study till about minus 40 degrees Celsius. Well, <clears throat> the sanctity is that uh, um, we expected these materials to go through a firm ductile neutral transition at minus 40 degrees Celsius, which also happens to be the minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So, <clears throat> coming to the uh, candidate materials and what we did with them, there's a golden question as to why we chose flexor and flexural fatigue. The anti roll bar that you use to stabilize an automobile when it negotiates a curve goes through a lot of flexor and torsion. And uh, the leaf spring also goes through a lot of flexor. So, we chose this as a test for the quasi static qualification or the lack of it, as well as the, as well as the um, quasi static test at sub zero temperature, followed by quasi static flexural test at uh, a fatigue pulsating transition. The fatigue flexural test at room temperature was followed by a fatigue test at minus 40, and for the leaf spring again, this test was uh, followed by a minus 40 degree test after DVD and we conducted extensive fractography and also other studies and uh, uh, the conclusions were a part of the methodology that we envisage. <coughs> Coming to materials and methods, I would like to quickly go through it as uh, all of you are metallurgists just like me. <coughs> There's nothing much in the material selection because we did not do any novelty in the material selection. We want it to be basic first as there were virtually no papers on this. <coughs> Coming to the SA1040, like you can see the composition, followed by the surface roughness. The surface roughness is important if you do flexor as well as flexural fatigue or any form of fatigue. Like we have to be careful about near threshold, threshold, and then the um, subcritical and critical phenomena. So we did an extensive study of control over the surface roughness characteristic of the steel tube followed by the glass epoxy tube. The glass epoxy tube was roll wrapped, tightly roll wrapped and then purchased <coughs> with specifications of volume fraction surface of game nature and the layers and then all that because composites are very sensitive to all this. <coughs> Next slide. The uh, steel beam as well as the <coughs> composite or the Glass fabric epoxy composite beam uh, was also uh, characterized according to the elastic properties, bottom ratio, as well as the uh, volume fraction and then other aspects. And then the um, surface of this parameters of glass fabric epoxy composite was also measured and evaluated. Coming to the conditioning aspects, there are a few uh, things I must thank uh, Dr. Sushil Mishra of IIT Bombay who has this uh, cryogenic uh, testing facility. You can freeze the sample in that temperature and also you can test the sample at that temperature after transferring the sample and uh, uh, making it uh, come back to equilibration uh, for a few hours and then you can conduct the test. They also have a low temperature STM or a sub-zero temperature STM. So this, this is immense thanks that uh, my PhD student and I uh, <coughs> So the, my PhD student and I are able to uh, 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 sit before you, or stand before you, sorry. 
So coming to the uh, sub-zero uh, temperature conditioning, uh, all the samples were, we want to keep it simple in the beginning. We wanted to keep it simple in the beginning. And uh, we were not looking at moisture content at all. So all the samples were wrapped tightly and then we exposed it to a conducting wrapping which stabilized the samples at low temperatures. <coughs> so you can see that this is the family SA1040 TTT diagram that we all study as undergraduates, but uh, the sample was taken from here to here over about 10 power 4, 10 power 5 seconds for uh, saturation equilibrium conditioning. There was no phase transformation or whatsoever it is, but we did go through what was called, we did go through what was called, there is no time temperature transformation involved, like it is just that from uh, uh, say uh, 0 seconds or 1 second, it was just taken to uh, 10 power 5 seconds uh, from a temperature of 25 to a temperature of minus 40. Like I did not have brought this diagram at all, but it's just for a comparison like where you stand in the picture. <coughs> so coming to the time temperature transformation diagram for the steel and the conditioning for the epoxy resin with the glass fiber, which is a bidirectional wheel. We again wrap the samples to ensure that they did not suffer from moisture effects, but we only consider temperature as a parameter. Here, the increase in uh, <coughs> the increase in glass transition temperature after the sub-zero temperature conditioning was studied by Sethi et al. This is being referred. There is an increase in glass transition temperature when you chill it down when they chill the glass epoxy composite down and uh, the molecular chains of polymers are frozen and uh, they limit their mobility at low temperatures. This is from my own earlier investigation. And the increase in glass transition temperature causes increase in strength and an incomplete reversibility of molecular chain mobility. It also causes residual stresses and slight dimensional contraction. <coughs> So uh, these are the instrument test parameters, like we deliberately chose the 1 hertz to 3 hertz for the anterior bar uh, the oscillation for pulsating testing in SETI as well as the uh, real life uh, situation that prevails in automobiles. So this is again the uh, detailed uh, setup that we used at ID Bombay with a feed rate for quasi-static test and uh, pulsating test for the uh, flexural setting from 1 to 3 hertz. <coughs> we actually conditioned it in an environmental temperature till about saturation equilibration to ensure that there was nothing transient for more than 12 hours and uh, then we transferred it to a chamber. We transferred it to a chamber in the uh, testing machine and equilibrated it again to ensure that while transferring, if there had been a marginal drop, we could be compensating for it. <laughs> Coming to the results, yes, this is a paper that has been accepted. We, from this investigation, we have nine papers, two of them in SAE and the two of them in ASM International, uh, Journal of Failure Analysis and Prevention. Well, this is the data and uh, you find that the, all these samples are unnoticed because there was no uh, literature available on the basic things and we decided to go on not first with a clear surface condition. <coughs> so we see an increase in from 25 degrees or 10 degrees Celsius when you go, this is more or less the same and then we see an increase in the flexural strength and we see an increase in the flexural modulus in the quasi-static test conditions. And uh, we have also done modeling and simulation in uh, ANSYS uh, ACP package to counter check. But we did not involve the defects that could be calibrated in the experimental uh, results. We did the zero defect sample, so the FEM results are slightly higher than the uh, observed experimental results. <coughs> you can see that the flexural strength increases by about 20% when you decrease the temperature from, say, about uh, 10 or 25 degrees Celsius to minus 40 degrees Celsius. So we've come to the reason and uh, there was a lot of factography done on uh, 25 degrees Celsius samples as well as 10 degrees and then zero and then we went on reducing and you can see that 
the initiation of uh, phases in the SA 1040 sample and find steps being seen at the uh, room temperature or near room temperature slowly give rise to <coughs> phases, flat phases, stair ridges, cleavage steps, and decohesion. And finally, what we get is a mixed intergranular as well as transgranular fracture at a reduced grain size. Coming to the fractographic features that we use, that we are kind of uh, observed rather, from uh, plus 25 degrees Celsius to minus 40 degrees Celsius. <coughs> no appreciable striations were observed on the compression side or tension side. The damage was prominently observed on the mid center at neutral axis for the root temperature. Slowly, we see getting phases, intergranular fractures becoming kind of more pronounced, and a lot of decohesion, cleavage steps, and uh, Limited quasi cleavage fractures and uh, a mixture of intergranular and transgranular fractures occurring. What happens is that when the material is chilled, the grain size reduces and then the grain boundaries become either as strong as or slightly stronger than the grains. So, what happens is that we get a mixture of intergranular as well as transgranular phases with a limited quasi cleavage fracture. Coming to the halted relationship, we observe that. The average grain size was about 4.7 micrometer at minus 40 degrees Celsius. And uh, uh, coming to the uh, room temperature, it showed an increase to uh, uh, say about 11.43 uh, or 12 microns. So it is a threefold, nearly a threefold increase from minus 40 to plus 25 degrees Celsius. And uh, when we look at the other aspects of all this relationship, you can get the idea, get a fair idea of the <coughs> fracture yield stress of steel based on grain size alone. <coughs> All the relations can be applied to the problem of determining the DVT temperature as well and then we got a good match on that. And uh, below the TV, if brittle fracture is transgranular cleavage by refining the grain size or reducing the grain size or making the gra grain boundaries stronger because of compressive residual stresses. Uh, the fracture stress increases, and uh, this was noticed in the air strain. In BCD materials at low temperatures, the microplastic strain occurs even in their most brittle conditions at a wedge strengthening of uh, We know the BCD strengthening mechanism, which is a wedge dissolution or a wedge strengthening mechanism. So there is a slight play there, and then it still remains microplastic. This is the data for FETI. For every uh, line you see, three samples were tested. We are testing more samples actually. I would say that I'm giving this talk after doing about 50 specimens. <coughs> this is statistically not yet relevant. It is, however, it is consistent. I would say that. So, what you get here is a fixed amplitude pulsating test where the initial loads are applied at 87% of the maximum quasi-static stress, 60% of the maximum quasi-static stress, and 30% of the quasi-static stress. So we got very interesting results in FETI, where <coughs> at 25 degrees Celsius, a sample that failed after 4,000 cycles went clean through 1 lakh cycles at a lower temperature. And uh, Similarly, at minus 40 degrees Celsius, 25 degrees Celsius, minus 40 and 25 degrees Celsius for the load ratios which were initially maintained at a constant, like I would like to be very clear, we maintain the pulsating constant amplitude for every load level, 87%, then 60% and 30%. So the initial load level was as we say, but the final load level can be marginally dropped either because of other uh, relaxation phenomena. So here, you see that what was bad at room temperature became a lot better at lower temperatures for 30% load and then 60% load cases. But for 87% load cases, the 25 degrees Celsius uh, test was bad and uh, we got a very good uh, response when you lowered the temperature to minus 40 degrees Celsius. So as long as an automobile is not notched or it's very smooth in surface, there's no need to worry, even if you're using SA1040. As far as petting is concerned, but there are many other things. <coughs> so, this is again the modeling and simulation that we did with uh, 
uh, ACT and analysis uh, program where we got a good match and uh, we can see that the fatty failure mechanism of SAE tube at room temperature is very different from the uh, fatty failure mechanism at the uh, I have six more minutes. So, I have six more minutes. Yes. So, the fatty failure mechanism of SAE tube at room temperature was uh, very different from the mechanism at low temperatures. All this effect residuals versus the, the major contribution. Here again, like the intergranular fracture was noticeable, and uh, we also studied the uh, fatty fracture growth, though at low temperature there's a lot of misting that prevents you from doing the crack growth monitoring. That was not possible, so I'm afraid that everything had to be post-mortem. <coughs> transgranular crystallographic processing was seen, and uh, we also had a mixed of intergranular to transgranular kind of an appearance with uh, limited particle weight uh, fractures occurring here and there. Fatty exfoliations were uh, actually seen better at room temperature than at lower temperatures, understandably, yes. In summary, like, uh, we can say that the fatigue strength improved at lower temperatures thanks to the mechanisms that we outlined just before. And uh, we are now uh, moving uh, to uh, the glass fabric epoxy tube specimen. Here again, the fatigue data and the quasi-static flexor data were kind of uh, done in an exhaustive manner. You can see that the sample is wrapped up in an aluminum point to conduct only temperature and not moisture. <coughs> that this is a picture of a glass epoxy tube with some known dimensions where uh, a flexor strength of 200 MPa increases to 350 MPa at minus 40 degrees Celsius. In <coughs> glass epoxy composite, the e-glass fiber is not known to be too friendly or too responsive. It is kind of ignorant to anything that happens between 25 degrees Celsius to minus 40 degrees Celsius, but not the epoxy and the interplay between the glass and the epoxy. <coughs> so we even did a modeling and simulation. Now you can see that uh, uh, flexural load is about uh, 3.27 at room temperature to minus 40 it is about 5.5 kilonewtons. And flexor strength improves from 200 to 330, which is, uh, I would say, noticeable to significant, not phenomenal. <coughs> so the one meter stresses were again analyzed, and uh, we got a good uh, um, idea about the failure patterns. And uh, strangely, epoxy resins, uh, though, are not in the habit of showing continuous static creations, which are quantifiable. They show some irregular. Uh, fatigue variations if there is uh, some bit of microductility or plasticity in it at room temperature. This vanishes almost at uh, low temperatures, making it very irregular and brittle. <coughs> but what happens is that because of the PG increase, residual compressive stresses, the fiber and the interfacial uh, shear strength appears to be a lot better because of a lot of compression. We observed a lot of fiber bakage and then epoxy uh, delaminations also, but they all happened at a higher load and higher energy level, obviously. <coughs> row of, I'm sorry for the spelling mistake, row of cusps they see, but uh, cusps keep reducing in dimension of the fiber matrix unbalanced shear couple that generates the failure. Uh, the cusp dimension reduces at lower temperatures because of uh, lower plasticity and uh, less susceptibility to shear. <coughs> So these are the data that we got, and then we are just going to see uh, what the fatigue uh, life has store is, life has in store for us. For the 83% uh, load of condition, like uh, it was granted for the glass epoxy beam, steel is always better, and uh, we are still not mentally prepared to use glass epoxy as an anti load bar. So um, this is the sad state of affairs for glass epoxy, but when you reduce the load to 67% or 33% of the load, what happens is that we get a good fatty life which uh, goes through 1 lakh. You may ask why there's 1 lakh and why there's 90 p. Normally for warranty like they choose about 10 for 5 for anti-load balls or uh, streams. That is about uh, safety 3 years, okay. They can't guarantee anything more than that because of competition and then more uh, revenues to be filled in through maintenance. 
This slide, so this is the modeling and simulation slide where we got a good match again. The fatigue failure mechanism of black box is used again like uh, we got uh, the same kind of uh, features for fatigue, but uh, sometimes like uh, we did get some creations which were not fiber matrix interfaces. We got some irregular creations at uh, <coughs> minus 40 Celsius also, but these creations were more pronounced at room temperature because of microductility. And the interface between the fiber and the matrix was a lot stronger at minus 40 degrees Celsius for reasons told you. And uh, coming to the molecular chain mobility of polymers and DBT, what happens is that this is a magic equation for all amorphous glassy polymers. And uh, there is a slope of 1.63 between shear modulus and then shear stress. And the mean molecular radius reduces at lower temperatures because of constants A and B that are dependent on Poisson ratio, which reduces at lower temperature and increases at high temperatures. And we even have the omega, which is solid angular rotation of molecular segment between the initial and activated configuration, and A3, which is nothing but the <coughs> mean molecular size. This work was done by Kitagawa, Bowden, Argon, and Brown, the MIT, earlier on epoxy molecules. So luckily they were a lot of help. <coughs> and at lower temperatures, you can extrapolate the results and then get whatever shear modulus, shear strain, and uh, the shear strength that you need. And finally, the wedge discriminations and then the mean molecular radius prove that the chain mobility is in fact restricted at lower temperatures, giving better rigidity and special rigidity stiffness and strength for the epoxy resin. So you know that in steel, O2A is a microscopic elastic region, and the macroscopic elastic region is from A to Y. So the cannibal mutualism between fatigue and microplasticity is kept going at a lower temperature where plasticity is barely limited not to compromise on strength. Summary, yes, right? The longer fatigue life at 67 and 33 percent load levels are very interesting for the uh, glass epoxy anti roll bars. And uh, at 25 degrees Celsius, uh, they do not go through DBT. The last part of my lecture now, I hope to finish in the next uh, two minutes. With your permission, yes. <coughs> These are again uh, two papers that recently got accepted in the ASM uh, Journal of Failure Analysis and Prevention. <coughs> The leaf spring C45 again shows similar trend, and the glass fabric epoxy beam specimen shows again similar trend. When all these are geometry dependent as far as the trend is concerned, but the scale of influence because of geometry is in fact a uh, major factor, apart from the basic metallurgical factors. <laughs> so the flexural strength showed improved behavior after DDP. And uh, increasing interfacial strength and interlayer abrasion is a key. And the longer fatigue lives are observed after DVT, provided it is not notched in the surface, is perfectly under control even at the near threshold or the lower level. A comparative study, finally, of the steel and the composite used in beams. Well, this is the blue is the low temperature property, and the maroon is the room temperature property. You can see that whether it's a tube or a beam. The quasi static flexural, the quasi static flexural strength and the modulus are higher at lower temperatures. And we even did a study from uh, shape factors. The shape factor for elastic bending based on thickness and shape factor for elastic bending based on strength. We find that uh, the shape factors for thickness and strength are dimensional and any dimensional distortion at different temperatures leading to. Um, compression or residual stresses is observed to have an appreciable influence on the stiffness and strength of steel in composite specimens, which show a 20% to 50% increase. So this is the final uh, table that uh, tells you everything, and uh, you can see that the uh, the arrows here indicate that they run through 10 power 5 cycles, and then there is no SN envelope. Same thing here for the glass epoxy tube and beam. And uh, flexion rigidity of the tube and beam shows uh, marked interest.